welcome back. And um, we want to continue our conversation about uh, lobular breast cancer. And right now, we want to move into some presentations that really kind of talk about what's new and what's coming in research, um, something that um, I think we're all, as patients, very interested in and what might be coming down the pike as we learn, learn more about lobular breast cancer. Um, a reminder to, um, for questions on the note cards, and if you are watching live stream, then you uh, can type in your questions into the comments. And also remember that following this, we'll have a Q&A and discussion session, and we will be able to spend a lot more time on, on questions as well. Um, so our two presenters to welcome back, we have Dr. Steffi Osterich. She's a professor of pharmacology and chemical biology at the University of Pittsburgh Cancer Institute, um, and also the director of education at uh, the Women's Cancer Research Center um, in Pittsburgh. And then we also have Dr. Hannah Linden, who is an academic breast cancer oncologist, um, who is a professor of medicine at the University of Washington and a full member of the Fred Hutch Cancer Research Center. So join me in welcoming. We'll start with Dr. Osterich again. Oops. There we go. Thank you again. Okay, it's me again. Part two. Um, as I started in the first part of the presentation, clearly, I think that focusing on the role potentially really enriched, unique role of growth factor receptor signaling uh, should be a focus. And uh, so I showed this to you earlier, that there are clearly overexpression and activation of growth factor receptors, like HER2 and HER3, and downstream signaling of a kinase. Kinase is something what uh, phosphorylase gene, it puts marks on genes to specifically make them hyperactive. Uh, and there should be, we should study more the mechanism and clinical trials. I want to highlight this paper, it was published, actually this is just a few weeks ago, and this is important. So they show that loss of vicotirin results in increased growth factor receptor signaling in lobular breast cancer. And I actually put a quote from that paper on that slide, which I would like to read. Uh, the low number of ILC cases and the lack of central pathological validation of histotypes and ecotherian status generally prevents from conclusions regarding the efficacy of PI3 kinase AKT inhibition in ILC. We identify, so this is what the, what the authors say, the growth factor dependent PI3 kinase AKT pathway as a prime target for the treatment of ILC. Because AKT, again, AKT is one of those kinases uh, which phosphorylate other genes and makes them hyperactive. Because AKT activation is a direct consequence of ecotirin loss, functional inactivation of ecotirin and other, these are other glue genes in ILC, which keep cells together, rather than, onco rather than mutations, should be used as inclusion criteria for clinical PI3 kinase AKT intervention trials in this breast cancer subtype. What it means is that there are a subset of uh, ILCs which have alterations in this kinase signaling, PI3 kinase and AKT, and that when we think more of clinical trials, we should really know whether a tumor is ductal or lobular, whether ecotirin is activated or not. And you know, I actually met one of you in the audience here last night, and uh, we chatted, and yeah, uh, talking about uh, being on, an AK on a clinical trial targeting AKT, and uh, you know, I think that's really something super promising. I think we need to study metabolism more. Differences sugar versus lipids. We are at the very beginning of this, but I think there's some signal there we should follow up. And you know, maybe we can ask 
Dr. Linden, if there are any unique opportunities for imaging uh, with respect to changes in uptake of sugars or lipids. The other thing we should study more is immune oncology. You know, one trial is ongoing, which is great. However, I think, you know, there should be more, but not just quantity more, but we should really think about those very carefully. They should be rationally designed. You know, there should be subset where we have specific biomarkers, which uh, we should study better. Uh, I'm going to show you two examples where uh, with recent publications for uh, studying immune phenotypes in nobular breast cancer. This is a study uh, from Christos Sartorius group from Belgium, where they really comprehensively looked at uh, lobular cancers and looked what kind of immune infiltration is in these tumors. And this was published last year. And another paper, another study, which was recently, just a few weeks ago, where somebody, and I think for research it's very, very important, somebody generated a mouse model where they uh, change genes in a way exactly how we see it in clinical specimens. And these mice get ILC tumors, and these IL tumors in these mice are actually of an immune, uh, immune reactive phenotype, just the same like uh, we see in a subset of ILCs. So this will be a great model for us uh, in research to make progress uh, in this subtype. And, you know, clearly, and this just came up, I think this is a big question we need to tackle better, is these late recurrences. Are these tumors just slow growing? Do they just hang out somewhere? Uh, or are they really, you know, are they sleeping? Are they going to sleep? And then you can awake them by, you know, we don't know, something happens and I, we don't know but somehow, suddenly, they leave the dormant state. We need to study this more. Imaging, I think, is the top priority. We need models representing late recurrences, and you know, for all of this, for us to make progress in research, uh, I think access to metastatic tissue is absolutely critical. If we can't analyze this, I think we cannot make progress. I already mentioned that there is a trial now ongoing in England as a result of uh, researchers looking at specific unique dependencies as a result of loss of Ekaterin, which is the hallmark of ILC. And I think we need to study this more. There are some slides here just to show again uh, that the loss of Ekaterin we see this in the primary ILC in the breast, but the same we see in metastatic lesion. So these are pictures from an IDC metastasis, and this is from an ILC metastasis. You can see that, again, these cells grow more in a line, and we, this is a staining specifically. If it's pink, it shows loss of ekaterin. If it's brown, it shows ekaterin. So again, you see these cells look different, and they remain, they keep the loss of ekaterin in the metastatic lesion. This is the basic science underlying this clinical trial, now ongoing in England. And you know, I think we really need to do more studies to correct the changes in the cellular skeleton as a result of loss of ekaterin. And how can we therapeutically uh, uh, use these changes? I showed you these cells earlier when I showed you these green IDC and ILC cells. It's not only that the cells don't stick together, the shape of the cells, the entire skeleton looks different, and we need to understand that and see if that brings therapeutic vulnerab vulnerabilities to the cells. And, you know, I'm ending with a slide what I think are major hurdles for ILC research. You know, you still have this, that there's a frequent perception that almost ILC tumors respond very well to endocrine therapy, and they present just good luminal A's, and thus, just like ER positive IDCs. I think, you know, I think there has been a lot over the last few years, but to make it clear that there are, yes, they are ER positive. The majority res responds to hormonal therapy, but there are all significant differences, and we need to understand that the cells look different. They frequently go to other sites. I think for us to study this in more detail is critical. There are very limited numbers of ILC models. 
and this is for both primary and metastatic lesions. There is still a lack of access to metastatic tissue. Uh, it has improved, but it remains a problem. And, you know, uh, clearly lack of information from clinical trials. I think retrospectively, to do subgroup analysis of trials which have been performed, it can be done if we have information on histology and if the numbers are large enough. Again, you can go back and look, but very often the numbers, if you don't enrich for patients with ILC, the numbers of patients in a trial will just reflect general frequency. So if you have only 10% in the trial, maybe you just don't have enough power to really come to a conclusion for ILC. So, you know, we should still try to do this. And moving forward, the trial should be enriched for patient ILC. And I showed you there are already a few trials specifically for patients with ILC. And my thank you slide is the same I showed you in my first talk. I'm still thankful to all the funders, to the folks in the lab actually doing the research, to LBCA, and to you being here. Okay, so I think there is progress here, um, and clearly there's, there's, a, there's a need. Um, I absolutely agree. We need to push for some sort of subset analysis, and so, you know, we can ask the three makers of the CDK4-6 inhibitors to pull their data and let us look at the lobular subset, um, and I think that would be a very important, um, a, an important place to go. But there have been these huge advances right now, um, you know, with the CDK4-6 inhibitors, with drugs that inhibit the PI3 kinase pathway. And sometimes you have to just try these drugs and see if it works for you as what we can do for you. The other big advance here is fulvastrant is an injectable drug. I always think of it as a little bit punitive because it's a large injection. Um, and there are, you know, at least five different oral SIRDs or, or other similar drugs in development, um, and those may be very active in the lobular subset. We've had the privilege of doing some clinical trials with some of these groups, and in those trials, the reason they've come to us is because we can do estrogen receptor imaging. So we can demonstrate whether the, whether the drug, whether the tumor has estrogen receptor expression at the beginning, and whether the drug causes it to be completely blocked. And we've, we've published some interesting findings showing that fulvestrant is a little bit limited, and we're hoping that some of these new drugs will actually be better. Um, certainly, you know, I have to mention this, PARP inhibitors are now FDA approved, and, you know, most people with a lobular tumor don't have a BRCA mutation, but some people do, and, and you need to know that because we got a drug for you, and these are extremely active, and we've seen them be active in lobular tumors as well as other tumors. Um, we're going to get some data soon about HDAC inhibitors, I think, that, that will show that a subset of people benefit from those as well. Um, and um, there are novel agents, including not megase, not a progestin, but an anti-progestin. So I think there are always things coming out, and it's important uh, to think about whether or not there might be something novel to try instead of sort of our usual approach. So. I do think that imaging, just traditional imaging, can be very useful, but it can underestimate the extent of disease, and, and it can be limited for some people. Uh, PET scans have gotten better. There, there's a lot less background to them, and I'll show you some pictures to back that up. Um, and we've done some work with the experimental imaging. We have an ongoing trial of estrogen receptor imaging, and what we're going to present in San Antonio is some data showing some nice uptake of uh, lobular tumors, and, and that actually um, uh, there are many patients who benefit from that type of imaging, and I'll show you a little bit of some pictures, but unfortunately, everybody, you always need clinical judgment to sort out, you know, what to really do. So I think Steffi mentioned these, perhaps not one of them. The preoperative trial that we're working on with the TBCRC and the group from, from Pittsburgh is, is to let you try on endocrine therapy before the tumor is resected. Um, basically, it's just a run-in, and we, we see um, whether there's activity against the tumor when we measure that proliferation index. Um, our site does not have the PLOPS trial open. That's more of an East Coast thing, but that's using a, um, the CDK4 and 6 inhibitor in addition to endocrine therapy in the preoperative setting. 
Um, what's interesting about the gelato trial that I just want to make one comment about, first of all, you have to be uh, a citizen of the Netherlands to get on the trial, so I think that excludes all of us here. Um, but what's interesting about it is, so the, the data from um, ESMO about uh, atezolizumab is that uh, it's actually effective in breast cancer, and this is a huge deal. This is about triple negative tumors. But when they were looking the, the, to, uh, at the inclusion criteria, it's not PDL1 expression by the tumor. It's PDL expression well by the, the infiltration of lymphocytes, by the, the 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 material that is next to the tumor, okay, the tumor bed. And so that's really what's gonna have to be looked at in those metastatic biopsies. You gotta look at the tumor, but you also gotta look at the cells that are sort of crawling into the tumor. And so some patients have what's called a TIL, uh, an infiltrative lymphocyte. Some patients don't. And then we need to see that there's PDL expression on that TIL. So, what I would say for a lobular tumor is if you have PDL1 expression on the TIL, even though you're not a triple negative tumor, it might be worth a try to go with that regimen, which I think will be FDA approved shortly because the FDA has been sitting on the data that we all know is about to be present, presented at ESMO. So that's going to be a new therapy for, for breast cancer, um, but really only for that subset of, of patients who have that immune infiltrate that, that has the target expression on it. But what's unusual about this is it's not the tumor, it's the cells next to the tumor. So these are all the many things we need to learn about. So I want to sort of show off about our FES imaging trial because that's open now. Um, the other trials we have open, we have a, we're targeting that PI3 kinase pathway, uh, an upfront trial with getatolizib. We do have a trial of Sanofi's oral CERD, and we'll soon have trials of other oral CERDs. So those are options for people um, locally and, uh, uh, you know, at multiple institutions. There's a tesataxel trial coming out. That's an oral uh, an oral paclitaxel, perhaps a little more tolerable. Um, and uh, I think it's important to think about some other novel targets um, as we try to sort of think out of the box. I think the problem with the HER2 story is that our criteria for giving you HER2-directed therapy is not a mutation, it's overexpression. Um, but I think we need to, to study this. So this is the poster we uh, showed at uh, San Antonio last year, just showing that we have an open trial. Um, this, is, this is funded through your tax dollars, through the intergroup. I'm the co-PI of this trial, and it's an estrogen receptor frontline imaging trial, and um, as you can see, it's not offered everywhere. The reason we can offer it is we can synthesize the tracer. We're working with industry to commercially synthesize the tracer, and I suspect that the tracer will be commercially available in a relatively near future. It's FDA approved in Europe right now. And then you could sort of see what your tumor is doing. Um, and uh, that's what the pictures are at the bottom. So these are two people with breast cancer. The, the group on, the, on your left is a ductal patient. The one on the right is a, is a lobular patient. We have an FDG study that um, you can see does have some background, but you can certainly see some spots that are, uh, are clearly tumor. Um, the liver in FES, estrogen receptor imaging, is uniformly uh, got uptake because that's how you clear estrogen. Okay, so let me see if I can man this, man. This is it. Okay. So these are, this is the spine. This is somebody who has a little scoliosis. Okay. But there's some spots of tumor. You can see they're much brighter by FES. And what that's telling you is functionally tumor takes up estrogen. So it tells you what the tumor's doing. It doesn't tell you about downstream mutations. It just tells you whether the tumor can grab estrogen and hold onto it tight. So the reason I'm showing you this is this one. It's a little brighter here. So this patient uh, has, you know, FDG uptake. And you can find it, it's, it's, not, uh, it's not stealth. But notice how much brighter all these spots are. That's how, that's very, very active ER uptake. This is a patient who feels fine. Okay, it was actually an incidental loma identified when she had a bone surgery for something else. So shocking case, she has like 100 metastases. She's fine. She did really well on endocrine therapy. But this is a lobular case. And um, what I'm hoping you can see is, wait a second, this is really taken up. Now, I'm not telling you that everybody has this kind of uptake. It really has to do with how much estrogen receptor expression there is on the tumor. But by participating in a study where you get an FES PET, you get a virtual biopsy of every tumor site except what's going on in your liver. So, you know, we took a piece of tissue from the axilla here to make a tissue diagnosis, but now she knows that every single met in her bones and, and, and uh, lymph nodes have ER expression on it. 
so that's kind of a useful tool because I think that's the question you're really asking. And if you're unlucky enough to present with an orbital met, is that all ER positive or not? So I think we're going to be able to make a virtual diagnosis for people, uh, but we can't do it yet. Um, and again, same thanks um, to uh, everybody because this is a, it's really team science. Thank you. So um, send up your send up your questions, and I'm going to start working on some of uh, some of the questions that we um, that we got in. Um, one is: Is mixed ILC IDC considered more or less aggressive than just ILC? The, the studies that I've looked at. Um, you know, it's a, unfortunately, it's a mix. It's about half and half. Um, they have more of the lobular type genes and half of them have more of the ductal type genes. And I think, you know, if you start out with a mixed primary, uh, it would be important to get a biopsy of the metastases to know what's going on with the metastases. So 50-50. 50-50. And how would a mixed tumor typically be treated? So it's so you, we're going to treat breast cancer the same way that we treat all breast cancers, and somebody with a mixed tumor is eligible for kind of both types of studies. Although that's one of the challenges of when you, if we just have a lobular study, should somebody with a mixed tumor get in? But I think the way to figure that out is do a tissue biopsy of what what's what's hitting you now. Right. You know, I mean, I think honestly, most people, um, you know, who originally have breast cancer and then present with breast cancer later, it's the same flavor, and I, I try to be careful to manage expectations, but we've got to know, is there HER2 overexpression in that metastasis that's extremely important, and is ER and PR preserved? But the other question you can definitely ask is, what does it look like? Does it look like a lobular tumor? Does it have you can't hear in loss, or, or does it look like a ductal tumor? Okay. So the one thing I could add uh, is that we are currently doing a study where we're basically pulling out information on, uh, you know, response to therapy, size, stage, ER contents, PR contents, contents of ER positive IDC, ER positive ILC, and these mixed tumors uh, from patients seen at our hospital system, and, you know, want to compare this. It's not part of a clinical trial, it's a retrospective analysis, but I think it will still be very informative. So we have like in this data set, we'll have hundreds of patients with mixed IDC and ILC. I think it will be a pretty large study and hopefully we can also pull some of those tissues and try to really understand more about it. Because like I think like many other uh, questions in ILC, I think we are still at the beginning. There isn't that much research on mixed IDC and ILC. A very, it seems like a simple question, but we don't know the answer for when we think more about really basic research of IDC and RC. We don't know if the precursor, the cell which becomes a tumor, we don't know if that is potentially different between IDC and ILC. That's a fundamental question we haven't answered. And maybe in these mixed, you know, we have maybe two cell types or the somewhat differentiate different and that's right. you, may have a, you may have a dual potentiality to yes. do things and that's why I think you gotta sort of see what's happening later to figure yes. it out. Yes, so we still don't know. Yeah. So um, we've talked a lot about uh, the future of research and some of the things that are happening and that are in, in the pipeline, um, including immunotherapy and we've heard a lot about immunotherapy uh, earlier today and, and some yesterday. Um, what, we have the gelato trial, we know, happening in the Netherlands. Uh, what do you all think of as the future of the status of immunotherapy as it might be applied to lobular breast cancer? Yeah, I think that the tissue stroma is gonna be the answer there. 
and that we're going to need to look at that carefully, which is what I was trying to trying to bring up about the, the atezolizumab trial showing that, that the PDL expression was just most important on lymphocytes. Truthfully, immune therapy has not been something that's been very helpful in ER positive disease. We've been studying it almost exclusively in triple negative disease because it's just a different setup. But there, there may be a niche, like Steffi talked about, of maybe 10 percent of, of these lobular tumors that actually do have this immune infiltrate around them. And so we need better tools to diagnose that. And then the challenge is going to be how do you treat that? Do you just give the immune therapy? Do you give it with endocrine therapy? Or do, is there a need for chemotherapy? And uh, no, we don't know the answer to that either, and we're going to have to work that through. Yeah, I would like to echo that. I think, again, we are at the beginning. There might be a subset there, but it's way too early to say. I mean, a simple question, is it going to be better in the primary setting or in the advanced setting? I mean, all the research which has come out very recently shows that actually the immune infiltration is higher in the primary tumor than in the metastatic tumor. So maybe it should happen early on and not you know, in the metastatic setting. But I think these are all questions. Right. We are at the very beginning, and more research is needed to look at these, look at the tumors. So, you know, one of the questions about this whole, you know, how do you prevent a late recurrence is maybe it's an immune-mediated thing. And maybe, you know, you know, so we have a vaccine trial looking at so whether we could sort of em em enhance your immunity. Um, but for in terms of getting access to these drugs, I think there are two ways. One is to participate in a trial, help yourself and help others. Another one is to have an obvious target. So right now the targets are PD-L1, and we're going to look at that on the on the lymphocytes. And if there aren't any, then you can't measure it. Um, and the other thing is this uh, MSI, as you talked about with the, the the mutational instability, which is uncommon in breast cancer. So um, one thing, Dr. Linden, you mentioned that an important part. Uh, an important thing that we need to be doing moving forward is to look at the CD, C, CDK4-6 inhibitors um, and pull a subset analysis of that to see how they might work with uh, lobular breast cancer. Um, and that gets right to a, a question that we have is how big is, um, is there a difference with CD4-6 inhibitors for ILC um, more compared with IDC, um, and is there a way to know that until we do the yeah, I mean, I, I've asked the question um, of the Pfizer group, and I've seen the, their data, mm -hmm. and uh, the, it shows that in the small group of patients that they think are lobular, and again, I don't, I don't really think a central pathologist has reviewed that for them, and I think that's why it's not published, mm -hmm. um, but they're, they're seeing activity of those drugs. So I, I'm encouraged by that, but I think what would be lovely is to get them to pull it so that we could have a significance um, and, and figure it out. But the odd thing, we've spent a lot of money uh, developing these drugs. They're very active. But we've absolutely failed to identify a target beyond ER expression and RB. That's it. We, we, we don't know anything more than when we started, which is really terrible. But they clearly help people who have endocrine sensitive disease They're, that you, you don't we're not giving them to triple negative patients so it's an er driven process and so i think you know i'm optimistic that lobular tumors are going to benefit from that i think where we get into trouble is that down the road your tumor develops too much resistance so you know i, I don't like to hold out hope that they're going to help you when you're on your 10th therapy but I think, you know, the people you were allowed in with a lobular tumor, and clearly some of those patients got benefit. Um, and is the hope, too, uh, that we're going to actually see an increase if we were able to do the subset analysis that we would see an increase to benefit or um, just understand better how lobular breast cancer might um, respond differently? Yeah, what's just a shame is I wish I could tell you what target to measure. Yeah. on the cell, but I don't, I don't think we figured that out yet, which is, which is heart-wrenching. Okay. Yeah, I think it's important to do that subgroup analysis. Hopefully it can be pulled and, uh, you know, because maybe naively you might think they might not respond as well because the cells don't grow that fast, right? right. So the, the cell actually cycle. proliferation, yeah. the cell cycle isn't as fast in these lobular cancer cells, so there might be the fear that they don't respond as well, but there's no evidence for that at all. 
at this point in time, and it would be nice to really, you know, look at this. Now, one uh, one thing I would say clinically is I, I don't like to use them right away because they're very expensive, mm -hmm. and there are some people who benefit from just endocrine therapy alone. And even though we now have survival data, that's actually second line. So you don't have to use them right away. And the other reason that we sometimes don't want to jump to use them is cost. Uh, like like it's an, an unaffordable drug, and we still have to sort of go through a mechanism to get coverage. Um, but what's interesting is one of my triggers to use the drug is if you have an effusion. Because if you have an inf effusion, if you have fluid building up in your lungs, um, you know, that's, that's highly symptomatic and very uncomfortable for people. And in the handful of patients that I've given the CDK4-6 inhibitor with the endocrine therapy, and I've got to think that, you know, I mean, I know that some of them are lobular, really rapid response, very satisfying. Not, not having to go back and keep on draining that fluid. Um, so I'm encouraged that they're very active, but I think uh, we'd like a little more information, and I think it will come out. I think there's enough pressure on the companies to release that, and it effectively gives them more publicity, so they're willing to, I think they'll be willing to do it. Okay. So we um, have a, a few questions related to, oops, related to um, the imaging. Um, and how can trials be designed to allow lobular metastatic patients to be included when imaging is a, tr a challenge? Yeah, so there's been pressure to not just go with traditional RESIST, and there's now something called RESIST 1.1 and another uh, measurement called PERSIST that are hoping to find ways to, to allow more patients to participate in trials. Honestly, the big barrier has been bone. Uh, because when bone heals, you get that sclerotic rim of healing tissue that actually makes the, the CAT scan and the bone scan look like there's a greater extent of, of tumor involvement. Um, so part of it is simply training radiologists, uh, but some of it is modifying the criteria for trial entry. And I will say that many current trials do allow measurable and, quote, non-measurable disease. Um, so I think the pressure has to stay on for, for doing that. And the, the, the challenge of allowing non-measurable disease is twofold because then you've got to figure out what you have at the beginning and you've got to come up with a way to measure it later because you want to know if your drug causes the tumor to shrink. Um, but uh, the, the Southwest Oncology Group trial where we looked at fulvestrant with or without um, an aromatase inhibitor, that, that trial involved non-measurable disease as well. And I think as we get better at this, we can perpetuate that moving forward and allow allow other types of uh, uh, measurement. Um, the, one of the other cooperative groups I participated in, ECOG Akron, you know, is, is an, it's an imaging clinical trial group, and so they're really struggling with this. And, you know, we had a nice meeting yesterday mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, about how we can allow uh, the, the, the adjustments in the way you measure things. So you're kind of doing a little bit of an indirect measurement, you're saying, well, we can see that there is something wrong in the bone. We can't get a caliper around it, and I can't tell you what size it is, but it's clearly there, and it's, there's uptake by PET or uh, there's a lytic lesion by CT. Um, so we know it's there, and then the way we're going to know if it's gotten better or worse is we're going to see if there's a new lesion rather than it just if the, the one little spot gets bigger. So that, that's kind of what RESIST 1.1 is, and, and I think that modification is going to move forward and have some uptake. Whether it will have uptake with industry is another challenge. And I think that's the depressing fact for me about the study of all these drugs is that most of the drugs that we all use have been studied in that very rigid resist fashion. And therefore, you know, we just worry that they're not at all applicable. So uh, with the study that you pre are presenting in San Antonio on the FES, mm -hmm. that, um, can you uh, share um, where this would be as far as in terms of use in a clinic yeah. commonly? So right now, you know, we're, we're using it under, under IND, meaning, you know, under tight regulation. So we can only use it in the areas that, that we're officially researching and that we have funding and approval for. There are multiple centers who can do this. There are multiple trials going on. But I think actually that because we have a multi-center trial now underway that's half accrued, um, you know, we'll get to the point where this will be an FDA-approved tracer, and then it will be useful and used. Uh, and, and I think the bigger questions are going to be, ooh, can we use it to detect things? Can we use it to actually make a diagnosis? I mean, we're, we're not there yet. So all those things will happen in the future. 
I'm trying to make them happen as fast as I can, but you know, there's safety issues or safety concerns and logistics, but um, I, th I think it's going to happen, and the, the tracer actually is approved in Europe. So I, I think uh, the U.S. will be not too far behind. And then following up again on the imaging um, is uh, the potential use of um, and where we might be as far as replacing imaging or complementing imaging with liquid biopsies. And what might that look like? Um, and, and if we're thinking forward into next generation, what, what might right. we be thinking? Right. About so that? prostate cancer has the PSA, the prostate-specific antigen test. It's specific for the tumor that you're measuring. It's unequivocal, and we don't have that for breast cancer, which is really heart-wrenching. But I think that's really what liquid biopsy has the potential to do. Um, probably won't help everybody, but will help a lot of people. And um, I think that's, that's actually what the NCI is interested in, pushing the imaging community now to do, is to compare imaging to liquid biopsy and, and show us where the synergy is and where, where the dissonance is. Right now, it's not specific enough uh, to be sort of regularly available, but that's, that's going to mature quickly. And I think liquid biopsy is a really promising way to measure sort of both two things. One is just the bulk of tumor, how much are you shedding, but also some specific things like where, what, what's happening to that mutation that we were worrying about in your cells. Yeah, maybe I can add a little bit on this. So we are super excited about liquid biopsies. The idea of, you know, uh, monitoring disease progression in the blood. Uh, like Dr. Lin said, the uh, potential to look for specific mutation as a reflection of the tumor responding or maybe not responding to therapies. I think the idea of just taking at the moment, you know, 10 ml, but maybe in the future a little finger stick or something, and then looking for using very sensitive technologies to look for specific mutation, and maybe that being hopefully imaging will develop and will be highly sensitive, like the FES imaging, but others, maybe it might be even before you can see the tumor that you have just a few molecules of DNA in the blood and suggesting, oh, the tumor changes and that therapy doesn't work any longer, right? And, you know, maybe there are, you know, specific opportunities to do this uh, for ILC as well, uh, you know, given we have mutations in ECAT here and so. I think we discussed that last night. Uh, yeah, so I think uh, liquid biopsy is very promising and there's uh, lots to be done. Right. So, um, Steffi, you presented a lot of really, in, a lot of good information about some exciting things that are going on in the lab right now for um, different targeted therapies. And one specific question that came in um, is what kinds of lipids are you looking at in terms of ILC metabolism? That's a really good question, and I cannot answer it. <laughs> uh, I just showed that when we look at specific genes, so, you know, pieces of DNA which uh, code for genes that then have a function in the cell, if we look at what really differentiates IDCs and ILCs is we can see that these ILC tumors have very high expression of genes which uh, code for, uh, you know, functional, functional entities which basically take up lipids into the cell and use it. And this is not an artifact of, let's say, when we do the sequencing that we have more fat cells around the tumor cells. We specifically look in these tumor cells. So what lipids are taken up and what they are made into, we don't know yet. Uh, we are excited about this, and we are excited about this thinking, you know, maybe there are drugs out which target some of these enzymes doing this. You know, maybe that could be used for imaging. Um, but it's, you know, I'm happy to share some of those slides thinking, or trying to tell you that there's a lot ongoing, but some of it is, you know, pretty in its infancy, and there's a lot of research needed. Right. No, I think there's the, the, the sort of how the cells process then and store sugars and fats and, and it is really important, but I don't think it's about what you eat. Mm -hmm. I think yes. it's about yes. a tumor mutation. So, yes. you know, I think people, you know, everybody who gets cancer thinks that, you know, they did something 
you know, it's because they looked at somebody wrong when they were little and this is, this is the wrath of someone coming down on you or something. And, you know, I, I think it's all good to eat a healthy diet, but I don't think you can control the proliferation of the cell by, by picking which fats you eat. Yes, thank you very much for adding this. Yes, so I'm saying in the cell, when we, in, the, in the lab, when we do the research, we don't know if it's lipid A or B or whatever. Right. But yes, I totally appreciate this. I'm not saying, oh, wow, you know, maybe the specific diet, the, the fat you eat has an effect on how these ILC tumor cells grow and proliferate. Yes, I didn't want to say that. I want to highlight the potential that there are pathways in these cells, which potentially we could use for targeting the tumor or for imaging. Right, and so they could, they could be, if there's spe a specific marker on the cell, then you could actually have an imaging tool that targets that. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So we had a couple other questions related to that. Um, is there any reason to think that anti-lipid medications, especially statins, might be therapeutically useful? Yeah, these are, you know, that's what, that's what I was sort of wondering about, you know, but it's, I think these are, you know, they're, we, if, depending on which day you read the newspaper, you see something good or bad about <laughs> statins, and um, I, I think we don't know that yet. Um, I, I think that what you're really talking about is how the cells themselves process things and set up their structures, yes. which allow them to be cohesive or not cohesive and also to invade. Mm -hmm. So this is intrinsic to the cell. It's not something you're going to override by ingesting, you know, your, I mean, take your statin if you have a problem uh, that you need to be on it for because, you know, I sort of joke with people, you know, we didn't cure your breast cancer in order to have you die of a heart attack or a stroke like every other American. So I think statins are good drugs, but I don't think we understand fully their role in cancer. Okay. And one other question related to the lipid uptake um, is could the lipid uptake correlate with estrogen that's stored in the fat cells? Hmm. Yeah, I think that's a very interesting question. You know, we don't know the answer. There are clearly, uh, you know, there's clearly some evidence that uh, some of these adipocytes have these fat cells secrete lipid-like compounds, which might function in a way like uh, estrogens. So there's, there are specific cholesterols, which we are now shown that they can actually bind to the estrogen receptor. And uh, this, at the moment, it's all at the level of, you know, us doing basic science in the lab, looking at how the estrogen receptor in these cells binds specific ligands. But within the lab, there are now a couple of groups that have shown that specific cholesterol, uh, 25, 27 hydroxycholesterol, can actually bind the estrogen receptor. So that's something very interesting, which again, I think we are at the beginning, but I think we'll follow this up there. Yeah. And then oh, I want to do one more um, question about targeted therapies, and then that is looking forward, we've, you've identified and laid out several different um, opportunities that may have identified in the lab that would tell us how the progression would typically work. So if it's identified in the lab and we've had different opportunities, what happens next with that? Yeah. So maybe I can start, and then maybe you can comment on this. But uh, you know, we have this bench to bedside or bedside to bench research going on all the time. That's the whole. That's what you need to make progress, uh, clinically meaningful progress. So I showed a couple of pathways, a couple of those slides, which were quite uh, complex. These growth factor receptors, IGF, EGF, HER2, HER3, where we find something. It looks like from the basic research in the lab that these might be pathways which are very active in a subset of lobular cancers. So this is in little plastic dishes. We have these cells. We find it. So the next thing we do is uh, we expand this. We use other models. And you know we do use animal models, for example, because you can't immediately always go into clinical trial. If we have more preclinical data, with different models, then you know we hope that this can be translated into a clinical trial. What happens very often, which is different, let's say, to five years ago, that now very often we already have sequencing information from clinical material, which even in the absence of a clinical trial gives us more confidence that whatever we see in the lab, with you know cell lines grown in plastic dishes, is really what happened in. Uh, 
in clinical samples. So yeah, so the next is to hopefully, you know, work together, uh, multiple groups, multiple hospitals, multiple cancer centers, for the reason that ILC is less frequent. These clinical trials can't be done at one institution, but you need to get folks together working in consortia, like Dr. Linden mentioned, for example, the TBCRC and others, and then start a clinical trial, yeah? Right, so, you know, there's a, there's a way that, because this trial's already sort of got some uptake in another country, we could pitch a similar targeted therapy uh, you know, through through that type of a consortium. I think to do a trial on lobular cancer, you're going to have to cooperate. That's going to require m multiple sites. But I think, you know, we're all very interested in these targeted therapies. It's scary, though, to take it right from the petri dish to the patient, um, because I'm not I'm not sure that that really ever works. Um, but but I think it's it's an iterative process, and I think if we get a hint that um, either of those trials are looking good. Um, it'll be ways to, it'll be fodder f to convince other funding sources to, to consider doing that kind of a trial. Terrific. Okay. Thank you very much.